Welcome to Breaking Banks. We have a special treat for you this week on Breaking Banks. My good friend, Mary Wisniewski, editor at large for Cornerstone, joins me to talk about things being more than money. In fact, that is actually the theme of her new podcast that she's launching at Cornerstone. Money isn't everything. And so I hope you'll join Mary and I talk about why you know money might be the root of all evil and stress and so many things, but money is not, in fact, everything. Her new podcast drops on April 18th. So it's no surprise, Mary, you are always one of my absolute favorites. Thank you, Jason. Chat with in general. Um, but I'm really excited that we get to break the story that you're launching within the Cornerstone world, your own podcast. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Spoiler and, alert. <laughs> spoiler. Money isn't everything. Why isn't <laughs> money everything? <laughs> that is the name of the podcast, which starts on April 18th, every other week. Um, money isn't everything because I personally just believe that um, my value system. But in terms of financial services, I'm thinking that more as you know, a bank or credit union doesn't just hold money. Like in theory, they're trying to do interesting things, um, you know, alter behavior outcomes, um, do things in identity. And so I want to explore, you know, the ideas that are probably not proven yet, but like the many ways that entrepreneurs or, you know, kind of someone who's at the bank or credit union trying to do something odd something interesting i want to explore what that might be and what that could do for banking generally so that's a really interesting angle that is often talked about mm -hmm. and something jennifer tesher and i recorded many an episode on right like we delve into things like financial literacy and you know banks and credit unions care about financial literacy but it's been an abject failure like billions of dollars wasted around this. When we talk mm -hmm. about money isn't everything and the role of the financial institution in how it can play, how do you think they get out of their own way, right? Like the passion is there, the building blocks are there. Why hasn't it been more successful? Well, I think there's never one answer to this. Sometimes it's just an idiotic attempt, right? Like, I mean, I think there's this, some, some believe that, oh, if you just teach someone um, you know, that they need to save money, they'll save money. But I find that very patronizing. That's not usually what's happening. Um, so there's, there's that on one hand. Um, uh, on another hand, I'm with you. I do think there's a lot of uh, people who are trying to actually improve financial outcomes. But I think one gap that I see is that like, there's a disconnect of like understanding someone's world and their cash flow, the like erratic cash flow. I think mm -hmm. sometimes it happens because, you know, uh, it's coming, these ideas are coming from a crowd who are used to like 401ks and, you know, the regular paychecks, but like, you're not necessarily knowing the nuances of, you know, people who actually have these problems in front of them. How did you become passionate about this part, right? Like you're the interesting juxtaposition of, you know, working for bank rate, right? And like traditional, Oh, I know. That was a surprise for everybody. I was like, what is this personal finance content? Yeah, but where's it come in, right? Like you feel like such an interesting niche within the cornerstone world, right? Like in what cornerstone does for traditional financial institutions. And, you know, here you come in and you're a little bit of the renegade in that, like you are the customer driven, consumer driven, passion driven. Where did that come from in terms of like, how do you marry those two things? Um, well, I think I'm just generally, I get excited about ideas. You know, I'm, I, I most identify as a journalist. Um, and so I get excited about going down a bunch of rabbit holes and, and I've always gravitated toward counterintuitive ideas. I find myself revisiting stories like that often. Um, and in terms of like, PFM. <laughs> Where did my love affair start with that? I'll tell you, Jason, when I wrote for American Banker, I was like, okay, what am I doing here? First of all, you know, I had to edit the op-ed section and it was really hard to edit it because we'd get these like really, you know, op-eds are always going to get really obnoxious comments. And, you know, at a publication like American Banker just times it by like lots more. And so I'm like, 
why they're calling them like um what would they call financial terrorists someone who like was in debt like i was like okay let's be a little I less love that phrase <laughs> so ridiculous um but also at that around that same time it must have been like 2009 ish um one of my first assignments was test all these pfm tools um and i was like okay this is this is interesting i'm a recent college graduate my salary isn't much most of these tools are telling me i have a negative net worth by a significant <laughs> amount and some aren't even accurate they're not even getting like how negative the situation is and i was like i don't know if this is the best assignment but I found, and this is actually my first guest, um, Ethan Block, who founded Digit, um, was among the first apps where I was like, hey, this is really interesting. I actually think saving sounds kind of fun through with this experience that he's creating. And, you know, I talk about it in the interview, but, you know, this was an early test of his, of his product, but it like, you know, just saved a couple bucks and it like showed Scrooge on a bunch of gold um, being like, congratulations, you know, uh, <laughs> and I was like, this yeah. is what I'm looking for. This is like turning a chore into something fun. And even though like, I don't have so much to save at this point, like it, it, it's just, it just showed me a glimpse of how financial services could be like playful, even when it's not, my situation wasn't grim, but it certainly wasn't great. So I just thought, oh, this is, this is a way, this is a way to change the experience. So do you think everything should be gamified though? No. Like digits an interesting, you know, case there. But mm -hmm. let's pull on that thread for a second. Like where where is the role in changing user behavior by gaming things? This is a big philosophical question. I don't know. I I think it I mean it can get dangerous, right? And it can and this too can get a little patronizing, but um what is the role? I think, you know, different things work for different people. I think for the kind of person who just needs a little nudge this is it's the it's the it's the motivational thing to do it's like you know people do if they're not wanting to go to the gym they'll you know they'll say I'll get my favorite smoothie afterward or something you know what I mean you yeah. pair it with something you like so it's like a similar idea not to say that that's what works for all people certainly it doesn't um, but it, it works for some people so I mean let's talk about nudges right like so the Thaler book I think hopefully everyone here has read you know, out of University of Chicago, how you can nudge behaviors. Mm -hmm. Should banks and credit unions play that role? Like, do they have a moral obligation in your mind to well, yeah. improve financial lives? I mean, I think so. I mean, can they? That's another, that's another question. But like, I, I heard it was Jennifer Tesher on a, I think it was a episode with Penny Crossman. And uh, she said something to the effect of, you know, whether banks or credit unions know it or not, they're in the financial financial health business. And I completely agree with that sentiment. Yeah. I mean, you're you're holding people's monies. You have you they, you have all the data that shows their behavior. You are in that business, whether you want to be or not. And I think that gets even more complicated when we start talking about the fintech startups. Mm -hmm. Right. Like this was what we wrestled with at Perk Street. Right? Yeah, I was, was gonna ask you, Jason, about your Perk Street experience. <laughs> <The whole idea. laughs> that nervous laughter tells me something. Yeah, nervous laughter. Yeah. Well, but the tension was right, what Dan and I set out to create is how do you because he had come from Capital One, I had come from First Marblehead, the big private student loan company, mm -hmm. probably the one that trashed your net worth with the loans that you had. Right? Yeah, probably. Dan and I were very good at, you know, getting students into debt. Uh, mm -hmm. credit card and uh, student loans. And what we wanted to create was that the idea was around, can you create an institution where the incentives are aligned? And 2008, you know, debit cards were meteoric lot growth, right? Especially right. Ar around recent college graduates. And we also knew people picked their plastic based on the rewards. We said, what if we could do cashback rewards on debit? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was the original premise is, can we actually give people the drug they want, e.g. rewards, on something that's good for them? It's kind of like, no one wants to go eat carrots, but I want right. to lose weight eating chocolate. Yeah. Can we go well combine those two things? But the tension was, and this is why I bring up the startups, our VCs viewed the rewards program as an expense to be managed, kind of like mm -hmm. how many banks and credit unions view, you know, a lot of these things, which is 
how do I actually give you enough sugar to modify your behavior? But not so much that it cost me a lot versus it was our product, right? right? Like rewards is not marketing. Rewards is product for us. And mm-hmm. that was always a tension, right? They're like, what if we dial back the rewards just a little bit more? <laughs> yep. That sounds, yeah, that sounds, well, there will always be that tension. That's why it's like, can we even solve this problem? Who knows? But you certainly need to try, I think. I'd argue that anyway. Yeah. In- I worry more and more as the world is more digital and mm-hmm. we have more data on individuals, how that could be manipulated to change our behavior. Like I think What's about the number of times at Amazon checkout, right? Like where you're like, and you should also be buying this. And you're like, my God, I should also be buying this. Like, how did I know? <laughs> I know. I know. I'm starting to, I'm hitting that point where I need to unsubscribe to certain brands and the emails I get. Cause I'm like, Oh, that looks, that looks perfect. Here's a perfect example. Well, it's actually, I'm glad I got it. It's a little roller skating charm. So of course I mean. it's roller skating. With you. <laughs> Bring your Barbie energy. Yeah. But, you know, at what point, where is the moral obligation for the institution? Right. Because, you know, um, Alex Johnson had made this point in a tweet a couple of weeks ago that the regulators exist to ensure the safety and soundness of the system, mm-hmm. not necessarily the well-being of the participants in that system. Mm-hmm. Right? Like in it was like it's obvious, but it was so profound to me the way he described that, right? And I'd say by extension, the banks and credit unions exist to like preserve their safety. The startups exist to make money. You know, yes. let's, let's call that out. Right? Yeah. Like they're there to make a return for their investors. And when I think about things like, you know, there's more to life than the money. How do we actually teach that? Because marketing doesn't, banking doesn't. Well, I mean, how do we teach that? Do you mean to like the bankers or do you mean to like? Yes, all of yes. it. All of it. You know, it's an interesting thing. And I I don't want to like replay everything I talked to Ethan about, but one of the things we were referencing is just like when he was creating this product, he'd run into the, to this, to this problem in a different way. Like a banker or credit union person would say, Hey, we already have, we already have a product. We already have a savings product. Check. Yeah. We already help people say we offer a savings account. Um, so it's like, it's a disconnect of thinking. So I think the one thing that does need to happen is that, um, how do we solve arrogance, Jason? (laughs) I don't know. I think honestly, I run into this more and more people, especially in this industry, seem rather rigid of like what they think they're already doing, what they're already accomplishing. It it seems to be this like elitist attitude of like, hey, I already do this um, and I do it well. But like, um, I think, you know, that's a little bit of the Wizard of Oz. It's the Oz. No, maybe you're not doing as much as it's as as you think you're not as powerful as you think. So I almost think it's an arrogance problem. Yeah. Well, and especially that I, we think we've solved the problem, right? Like if you looked at a bunch of incumbent bankers and providers when Venmo was founded, Mm -hmm. Oh, they said, Hey, you know, do we need another way to, to pay people? And yeah, they'd be like, no, like we're all good. (laughs) Exactly. We have checks, we have credit cards, we have yes. wires, we right. have so all these different ways. And it, and it's just a different way of thinking. Like the brain is wired differently, especially, you know, I, I often find there's, you know, a banker is going to like a lot of data, a lot of numbers. It's more, it's more of a, I would say it's more of a box. The mind fits more of a box kind of personality. But I, I, I think it's just exposure. You know, you talk to more people, but honestly, I think, social circles need to broaden of like you know just don't don't take it out on the golf course certainly you're not going to solve financial issues there or maybe who knows maybe you will have an idea i don't know let me get you a cashier's check (laughs) but i would just say exposure tends to be the best path um toward it and i to alex's argument i i mean i totally understand where he's coming from but also you know i think you could also argue to be competitive to remain uh, relevant as a bank you need to like um you know help sell 
people's problems. So that's why they're using you, you know, like I know we're still at a place where most people keep the same bank account. Sure. They open up their accounts um, and whatnot, but like, I hope there's a day. I hope there's a day where a bunch of people are just like, bye to you because you don't offer this feature. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, in, you know, this is, actually a point that Shamir Karkul has made several times in our conversations. It's interesting in the feature race Mm -hmm. within banks and the startups, we haven't really gone as far as we probably could and should have over the last 10 years. Yeah. So I'm curious, what features do you want to see? (sighs) I, see, this is what I like to think about because I'm like, oh yeah, let me create award-winning product, and uh, <laughs> that would be great. What features do I want to see? I think um, I certainly want to see features that are more catered toward volatile income. I feel like it's a very underexplored category to this day, and I think you know more and more people like that's becoming the normal way people are making a living. But it's it's much harder to um, operate on typical bank or credit union products if you don't know when when you're getting paid and for how much. Um so I'd love to see that. Um since we're in a in a time period of like, you know, um savings is going down, um interest rates are high. I'm curious about ways um to incentivize paying off debt. And um I'm wondering what could happen there as well. What I mean, you- that one's an interesting one. Yeah. The, out of our fund, we see a lot of startups really pitching this idea of how do you help incentivize getting out of debt? Right. But if you think about it, like the people who provided the debt, the last thing they want to do is like necessarily get you out of debt. Right. Right. Like there's this fine line of like, I want to maximize the amount of debt you can take on. Right. Like this was us at first Marblehead is maximize the amount of debt, but not so much that you actually default. <laughs> That is my evil laugh for all the listeners out there. Yes, that feels like that would be the pervasive belief. But then still you see examples of people trying different things. Um, something that caught my eye was in December where I was speaking with Lamine at Seller FI. He, yeah. Uh, credit building product, pay your bills, report it, build your credit in theory. But he did. he's doing a very curious experiment for customer acquisition. He bought a bunch of debt and um, is marketing to those people. Hey, we forgave your debt. And then also, you know, of course they want customers as a result. And I'm like, well, this is a really bold, (laughs) bold test that I can't really imagine so many people in this industry trying, but I'm like, every, you can just find, you got to try an idea. And I think that's really interesting. Well, that's a really interesting approach. And (laughs) I love the boldness of that. Like I, I, I hope it sparks others to think boldly about what can we go do? And how, yeah. how can we change that? Right. Um, what other great stories do you have like bottled up that you're going to be showcasing? Oh gosh, this is a hard one. I, cause I've been thinking about like how I want to set the stage for this. Cause I'm really open to just like, I'm just really open. I'll leave it there. <laughs> you know, I have no set agenda, but one, but the theme that I'm starting with is like, I want to like, look at, um, you know, people I've known over the years, because I also think it's really, here we are at this time where, you know, it's a little less starry eyed in fintech right now. And when I started this beat, 2008, similar undercurrents were going on, like, you know, things aren't so great, but then it opened up a lot of interesting ideas and opportunities. So I want to revisit some of my earliest conversations for my podcast on this of like what they saw then, how it might be useful to people now who want to explore creativity at a time when, you know, people are going to especially be like, you know, we got to pay these bills. Um, So I, I, I just, I think there's tons to learn about people's experiences. So I'm almost starting as like, this is what we can learn from the old guard. And by old guard, I just mean 2008 to set the tone of how to like, think about this. Um, Okay looking ahead. But, you know, of course, I'll probably be exploring. Um, I'm afraid to say it, but I will. AI. Um, there's an author of a book I really want to have a conversation with <laughs> because he just wrote a book. Um, I want to explore, 
you know, some of the journalists breaking stories on questionable banking practices, because I think that too reveals ideas that should be, you know, um, built as remedies. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll just we'll just see how this goes. But that's how I see the beginning of money isn't everything. Well, I'm curious, what shapes your view on money and it being more than money? Probably my whole existence, Jason. So I'll just, I'll start talking about my childhood. Um, so I grew up, my mom was a librarian and my dad was an accountant who turned into a CFO. Um, I never really thought about money, you know, growing up, like not in the, you know, some people are like, let me save. And I was like, you know, doing summer jobs, either, you know, waiting tables or um, working as a library page, but I always spent everything I made. <laughs> I wasn't like thinking long term. I was just like, okay, let me, let me go buy some outfit or something like that. So I think I was um, colored by my mom's thinking more than my dad, especially then. Um, and so I grew up in a family where what mattered most was family. Um, what mattered most was like, reading great books, um, great storytelling, um, exploring your creative passions. One of my favorite stories, I did a reel on this on Instagram a while ago, but my I have two other brothers. One's very artsy, one is like not as much artsy as I, as like he, he works in finance. Um, but the one brother, Tom, was playing his saxophone probably at midnight, they're both in high school. He's playing it outside of my other brother's room because the acoustics are better. And okay. of course, my oldest brother is super duper mad. So he like screams and says like, I'm leaving. And he drives his car to the back uh, yard and parks it there <laughs> as his way. But I think that just shows an example of like, I lived, I, I grew up in the Midwest living with a family that always encouraged, and my dad too, encouraged like creative pursuits um, and connections with people. And um, so that's always colored my thinking on money. Um, and then as it became my beat, um, I just thought, wow, you know, I know this is an industry that needs to make money, obviously, but, um, it's also an industry with so many, um, gaps that like the most interesting stuff is around those gaps to me. Um, yeah. So that's how, I mean, it's an interesting overlay right like you are an artist in terms of what you do and write. It's one of the reasons mm -hmm. i love having you is you're you not <laughs> you know a sanitized version you know of writing <laughs> no, i'm not right? a sanitized version <laughs> i mean let, let's just call out everyone should go read mary mm -hmm. has a phenomenal piece in it was the la times right your yeah. piece on dating yeah right I like did. you are not your typical personal finance or bank reporter. <laughs> no. yeah, the be right. There's cover. a lot of banking reporters who have their side writing. It's definitely like the romance writers and all kinds of things. Man, I just don't get interviewed for those then. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> is I have to talk about Baz regulation? I mean, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my only passion. But mm -hmm. it's an interesting overlay in terms of the emotion you bring to it because mm -hmm. I think it's easy in the industry to lose sight of how deeply passionate and emotional money is yeah. in our lives. Like money mm -hmm. might not be everything, but it sure enables a lot of things. And it enables all things. And without it, of course, it causes so much, so much hardship, so much mental health challenges. I mean, the Pew survey, right? Like yeah. the number one source of stress for people is running out of money. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, so sympathetic to it because I I just I know that feeling. I remember working with someone who was getting calls from a debt collector and just to like you you break down. You're here you are trying to work, make your income, but in, in her case she was just young. Um so it was just a matter of that. But um yeah it's well this leads me to this is the other thing I want to explore on the podcast mental health and money. So that's going to be an undertone of the podcast as well. Oh I love that. Yeah. So if people want to listen to Money Isn't Everything, where do they find it? Remind find people it. when it launches. <laughs> well, they won't find it yet, but on April 18th, it will be it will be proper. It will be on all the, you know, Spotify, Apple, et cetera, et cetera. You can also um, just find it through Cornerstone's website. We have a tab. We have, a, we have other podcasts. So um, Cornerstone Podcasts, 
um, it will be linked there, but yeah, it will be on all the podcasts. Yeah. Everyone should be listening to Sam and Ron and Dominic and you guys. Like the hustle is one of my personal favorites. Yeah, the hustle. So for the people who don't know the hustle, the hustle is Sam goes to a bunch of industry events and um, you know, does interviews with a couple of people there. And it's and it's always unscripted. And he's always wearing a hat, usually, not always. Never say always. <laughs> I'm pretty sure always. <laughs> I think this yeah. one is not hyperbole. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Because I'm nervous of that word, but yeah. So it, it's going to be a good time. And I made a fun trailer, let's say. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I hope it has Barbie and Ken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mary. And can't wait to listen to the first episode of Money Isn't Everything. Jason, thanks so much. Really appreciate the, the time here. This show is brought to you by Alloy Labs. As much as we love talking on the show, we believe that action is more valuable than talk. Alloy Labs is the industry leader in helping fearless bankers drive exponential growth through collaboration, exclusive partnerships, and powerful network effects that give them an unfair advantage. Learn more at AlloyLabs.com. Alloy Labs. Banking Unbound. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend, or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.